Throughout this module, we've talked about the central importance of identifying and assessing the hazards around you, both in the tree itself and in your immediate surroundings, before you make the first cut with a chainsaw. We've touched on some of the defects and growth characteristics in the tree that need to be taken into account, but we haven't discussed them in any depth. In this section, we'll take a closer look at the main things you should watch out for when you're assessing a tree in preparation for falling it. Keep in mind that visual tree assessment is an advanced topic, and there are many factors that come into play when you're trying to predict how a tree will behave when it's put under stress. There are lots of reference books available on the subject, which you should follow up if you're interested in learning more about visual tree assessment. For some suggested reference sources, go back to the Information for Learners section and have a look at the resource list. You'll also find a more comprehensive coverage of the topic in the Chainsaw Operation booklets that go hand in hand with this presentation. These booklets are also referenced in the Information for Learners section. We'll start our discussion with the basic process of assessing a tree. Some tree fallers like to inspect a tree from the top down. Others like to take a bottom-up approach. It doesn't matter which approach you use, as long as you systematically assess the tree and its surrounds, taking into account all of the potentially hazardous features or growth characteristics. For this discussion, let's start at the top and work down. We've already talked about overhead hazards that aren't actually part of the tree in other sections, so we won't go into further detail here, other than to restate some of the main ones. While you're looking up and around, keep an eye out for signs of native wildlife that may be living in the tree. Many trees, particularly overmature and dead trees, perform an important role as habitat trees for a wide range of native birds, reptiles and mammals, some of which may be threatened or endangered. Always check with your supervisor if you think that the tree you've been asked to fell may contain a protected species. Now let's turn to some of the other organisms that live in trees. They include wood decay fungi, termites, borers, and mistletoe. Wood decay fungi are a broad group of fungus species that rely on wood fibres as their food source. This photo shows decay in a felled tree that has completely destroyed the heartwood, and yet it's left the outer shell virtually untouched. The amount of internal decay or hollow that a tree can tolerate without failing structurally will vary according to the species of the tree and also the thickness of the shell. If the shell of soundwood fibres is too thin, it will be more likely to fracture under stress. The shell thickness needed to support the tree will also depend on whether there are openings or other defects in the stem. One of the most obvious signs of extensive internal decay is the presence of fungal fruiting bodies on the outside of the trunk or branch. These fruiting bodies are often called conchs or brackets, and they release fungal spores into the air as part of their reproduction process. Termites are another wood-eating organism. They're sometimes called white ants because many species have a whitish colour, but in biological terms, they're actually more closely related to cockroaches. It's common for some species of termites to eat out a pipe through the middle of the trunk and into the branches. From the outside of a tree, termite activity can be difficult to detect. However, there's sometimes evidence of galleries and mud runways under the bark. There are thousands of species of borers that attack timber. Most borers are beetles that do their wood boring in the grub stage of their life cycle. These line drawings are examples of a typical longicorn beetle and grub. Borers are more likely to attack dead, dying or injured trees, since cracks and wounds provide easy access. Apart from the direct damage they do to the wood tissue, Borers can also introduce infections into the tree and provide openings for fungal spores to enter. Mistletoe is a common name for a range of parasitic plants that attach themselves to host trees and feed off their sap stream. Although mistletoe plants don't destroy wood fibres in the same way that fungi and termites do, they can still send a tree into decline by progressively taking up more and more of its food supply 
and eventually killing the branch that they're growing on. Some trees are able to recover by dropping the affected branches, but in severe cases, the mistletoe ultimately kills the whole tree. Now we'll move on to the main causes of poor branch attachment. In most trees, poor branch attachment is caused by either epicormic growth or included bark. Let's start with epicormic growth. Epicormic growth arises from epicormic buds, which normally lie dormant underneath the bark. When the tree is stressed or damaged, such as from a bushfire, drought or insect attack, the buds respond by sending out new shoots. The problem with branches that develop from epicormic shoots is that they only have a shallow attachment to the stem. These epicormic branches have grown out of a pruned codominant stem. Here they are again from a different angle. Epicormic branches tend to be much weaker than branches that form during normal tree growth, since normal branches are embedded well inside the main stem that they're growing from. Included bark occurs when the angle of the fork between the branch and stem, or between two co-dominant stems, is too narrow to allow them to both grow in girth without trapping bark in the junction. The trapped bark acts like a crack in the junction, because it separates the wood fibres on either side. As the branch and stem continue to grow, they push the union apart and make it progressively weaker. In some trees with co-dominant stems, a rib formation develops on either side of the weakness to help support the stem. The pointier the rib is, the larger the internal crack is likely to be. When a weak union starts to develop other defects as well, such as insect attack, fungal decay or cracks in the wood fibres, its structural problems become even more serious. In these cases, the branch or stem is much more likely to fail under stress. We've already discussed various examples of stem defects, but here's a few more markers of underlying structural weaknesses in the stem. Bulges are enlarged or swollen areas of the stem that occur around regions of advanced fungal decay. They develop as the tree tries to strengthen the weakened area by building thicker growth rings around it. Note that not all species of fungi cause this response, so a tree could still suffer from extensive decay without showing a bulge around the infected area. Butt scars appear as a triangular shaped gap at the base of the tree. Some people call them fire scars when the initial cause was a fire which allowed access to attacking organisms. The opening generally has a hollow behind it which may extend up through the trunk as a pipe. Remember that trees can withstand a hollow stem and an opening at the base as long as the shell of good wood is thick enough to provide structural support and the opening is not too wide. A good way of checking to see how thick the good structural shell is in a tree is to put a vertical bore cut into the trunk with a chainsaw and feel the resistance on the bar as you push in with the cut. Obviously you'd only do this if you were removing the tree. A non-destructive method is to do a tap test on the trunk using either the back of an axe or a sounding hammer and listen for a drummy sound where the hollows might be. Cankers are localised areas where the bark and cambium have died. They often result from attack by organisms or mechanical damage, such as through impact from passing vehicles or lawnmowers. Wounds are injuries that expose the sapwood underneath the bark, and in serious cases may extend into the heartwood. Old wounds may be associated with insect attack, fungal decay, and localised hollows. Cracks are a separation of wood fibres. They can occur in the stem, branches, and roots. Deep cracks can be a serious structural problem because they reduce the tree's ability to withstand stresses and also allow fungal decay to develop. We'll finish our overview on tree assessment with burnt trees. Burnt trees pose special risks to bush workers, especially after an intense wildfire. Fires don't just burn from the ground up. They can extend well into the root systems and burn out hollows and pockets underground that may collapse later. These hollows can cave in under the weight of a vehicle or in some cases even a person walking on top. 
Although burnt root systems can be very difficult to see directly, signs of possible hollows include unusual depressions or soil movements near the base of the tree. Chimneyed trees are another serious hazard. These trees burn with a chimneying action where the hollow pipe inside the tree sets up a convection current that draws air in at the bottom and fans the flames on the inside. Chimneying trees burn with great intensity and will eventually fall over once enough wood fibre has been consumed. Even if they remain standing, they can still be extremely unpredictable and prone to collapsing at any time without warning. The same caution applies to any standing tree that survived a fire. It could still be carrying serious hazards such as dead wood, hanging branches and structurally unstable crowns. Always look up before walking under the crown of a damaged tree, particularly when the branches are touching or entangled with neighbouring trees.